Good morning, everybody. We are going to go over, well, happy day to you wherever you are um, in your day today. We're going to talk about India today. And in an effort to make this video not as long as Persia or yesterday's video, the Persia video, um, I'm going to skip over the videos, but I really want you to go back and watch them. Okay. Um, so first and foremost, we're going to talk about Indus civilization, and then we're going to talk about three really important empires that you have to know um, that emerged in the Indus River Valley. Okay, so classical Indian civilization began in the Indus River Valley. All right, and it spread to the Ganges River Valley and then spread throughout the Indian subcontinent. This spread continued with little interruption because of the geographic location of India. Remember, India is a subcontinent because it juts out from the Asian mainland. And it's separated by two mountains, two sets of mountains, if you will, the Hindu Kush mountains and the Himalayan mountains. All right. So if when, not if, but when you watch this video on the Indus Valley civilization, you'll hear Mr. Green talk about the constructs, the intellectual constructs that historians use or people looking at the past use to determine if a civilization was present. Um, some of those constructs are surplus production, the city being there, um, specializations of labor, trade, social stratification, meaning a social hierarchy, centralized government, um, shared values and beliefs or religion, right, and writing. And almost always in early civilizations, you have rivers, okay? Um, physical barriers such as those mountains I was telling you about, the Himalayan mountains, the Hindu Kush mountains, and of course the Indian Ocean, all made invasion of India very difficult. However, mountain passes in the Hindu Kush mountains, such as the Khyber Pass, did allow people to migrate into the Indian subcontinent. Do not forget that India is a peninsula, and a peninsula is a body of land surrounded on three sides by water. All right, the Indus and the Ganges are very important rivers, okay? They, they are the lifeblood of this region, okay? They provide rich, fertile soil, water, and of course, protection, like we said before. Our three, river, three reasons to settle in river valleys are water, soil, protection. All right, the Indus River is located in present-day Pakistan, whereas the Ganges River is located in India. You have dom dominant physical features that include mountains, right up here, right? Um, the massive triangular shape um, of India, right? Pretty cool. And rivers. Those are all physical features that dominate this peninsula. All right, why Indus River Valley? Well, historians believe that the Indus River Valley experienced reliable flooding twice a year that made the soil very rich. Flooding would provide irrigation for farmers and thin layers of fertile silt that increased the nutrients for soil and the soil for crops, okay? The flooding that came each year due to changes in wind direction is called a monsoon. All right, now, here is your extra credit opportunity. Um, this song by Mr. Nicky goes over the entirety of Indus civilization from its beginnings um, to its end. Okay. So if you learn this song, you send me a video of yourself singing this song, um, you will receive a hundred project grade. Okay. But now let's talk about the two well-known early cities. Everything we know about these early cities or about Indus civilization is through archaeology, okay? Harappa was a well-known Indus Valley city. From the city remains, archaeologists can tell they were well-planned out cities, um, laid out in a grid-like fashion, almost like Manhattan, okay? India is believed to be the largest of the four major river valley civilizations. And civilization was not discovered through its remains until the 1920s and is still a mystery to historians because they cannot decode the early Indus script, which is different from Sanskrit, which was introduced by the Aryans. Mahanjo-daro is another well-known Indus civilization. Historians believe that these ancient cities could house up to 80,000 people, which is pretty spectacular. 
These buildings were made of mud bricks that had been heated to make them harder and more of sound construction. Wells and water drainage systems were in place. When you watch the video, it will tell you they had plumbing. All right. Um, they had main roads and small roads were laid out on that square like grid like we were talking about earlier. And homes were built alongside the roads. And in your reading, you'll know that the Citadel was on top. All right. And it housed storage. It was storage for grain and things that were very important to provide life throughout the civilization. Um, most of the written language that historians have found from this early civilization are written on seals. Um, you have thousands of artifacts that have been uncovered with four to six hundred different symbols on each seal. All right, Indo seals have even been found in Mesopotamia, leading us to believe that the Indus civilization also traded with the Mesopotamian civilization. All right, now it's coming to our empires, okay? Um, what, what you need to know, well, the, these early cities or this early Indus civilization was very peaceful, all right? All historians agree that about 1500 BCE, there was a shift in culture. Some historians believe that the Indo-European culture replaced that of the indigenous cultures already within Indian civilization. However, other historians believe that there was just a mix, okay? Um, the Aryans developed Sanskrit to copy legends and religious rituals. So let's talk about the Aryans. They are also the Indo-Europeans. All right, they migrated into India through the Khyber Pass and the Hindu Kush Mountains. And then I've already told you about that theory, but they also brought with them Hinduism and they instituted a caste system. This period of time is known as the Vedic period due to the fact that Hinduism became a major religion and the Vedas are the holy texts. So the Hindu holy texts are the Vedas. Therefore, you get the Vedic period. All right. This is your caste system. All right. There are believed to be four Varnas. Okay. Um, a Varna is simply a caste. All right. In all actuality, the bottom caste on this should not even be there because the untouchables or the outcasts were seen as being outside of the social class system. So the four Varnas are Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Sudras. All right, your Brahmins are your priests. Your Kshatriyas are your warriors and your ruling class. Your Vaishyas are your skilled traders and merchants and minor officials, and your sudras are your unskilled laborers. A person's birth or their jati determined their caste or class within society. So the caste system influenced all social interactions and choices of occupation. Caste was a major social and cultural institution. Higher caste are thought to be more pure than lower caste, okay? Occupations of Dalits or the untouchables would be to dispose of dead bodies and things like collecting trash, um, things that other people would not want to do. All right, now the Mauryan Empire, that empire began under Chandragupta Maurya when he took advantage of Alexander the Great. Remember we said Alexander the Great took over the Persian Empire. We're going to talk more about him when we talk about the Greeks, okay? But he took over this area. Well, when he left after his death, rather, um, and the empire split up, there was like a power vacuum. Once he departed, all right, Chandragupta Maurya took advantage of this, and he conquered the Magda Kingdom, and this began the Mauryan Empire. Through an aggressive expansion policy using marriage, diplomacy, and war, Chandragupta took control of much of India. His grandson took power after his father, um, after his father died, rather, and he is going to be the most widely known Mauryan emperor. All right, why? Because Ahsoka inherited a large empire, right? 
um, but he still wanted more. So he set his sights to conquer the remaining portions of India when he went out, conquered, saw war, saw the death and destruction it caused. Um, he was very saddened. It hurt him, right? Um, he adopted the religious philosophy of Buddhism after that and the policy of ahimsa or nonviolence. And he united the Indian Empire under peace. Under Ahsoka, you have hospitals to care for the people, veterinary clinics to care for animals, and good roads. He had people um, plant trees and build shelters along the roads for travelers to provide shade and a place for them to rest. Ahsoka also sponsored Buddhist missionaries that made it all the way to China. Okay. Next, we've got our Gupta, Gupta, Goopity Goo. They've got a golden ticket for you. I like to do this because our Gupta Empire is our golden age of classical Indian culture. And Gupta just sounds like something Willy Wonka should make. Um, so what do the Guptas give us? Well, they give us the mathematical concept of zero. It's believed that this empire is the first to use math, um, not mathematics, but algebra as a form of math. Um, they made medical advances such as bone setting. Um, for astronomy, they came up with the concept that the earth is round and that it rotates and um, it's a round earth. They had new textiles such as cotton, right? And then literature. The earliest known Indian literature comes from the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. There we go. These are two of India's epic poems. The Mahabharata is the longest poem of any written language. And both are filled with moral and religious lessons. All right, Kalidasa is a famous um, poet or author from this era, and he writes The Cloud Messenger. Um, also during this empire, Hindu and Buddhist temples and shrines were built, um, and much of the wealth of this Gupta empire came from pilgrimages to these religious sites. And that takes us to Hinduism, which is all for today. I hope you've enjoyed the lesson on India. If you have any questions, email me, text me, call me. Have a great day, guys.